All right, everybody. Welcome back to the letter B six times. And last time we quote unquote rescued Violet, even though she was on the ship to begin with. But the ship is still kind of lost and crashed and basically not working. Except for the radio. The radio's good. Uh, Solai, by the way, is the guy who made the soundtrack, and he is awesome. So glad that's still working. And where do you begin is kind of a good question. The game is very open-ended. You'll run into some challenges in trying to find your crew members. Uh, but we were given a map that had lots of question marks on it, and that tells us where teleporters might be, and near teleporters usually are our crewmates, and if they're not near there, then we might be able to get them there. It really doesn't matter which order you rescue your crew members in, there are some little bonuses you'll get, which I can explain in a bit. <laughs> That's probably a good treat for him, considering that I don't think these things have teeth. <laughs> Watch that sugar high. That's about all that Violet has to say. We have four options, as it were, for people to rescue. You can get some little extra benefits, depending on if you rescue them in a certain order, but you're not obligated to. For example, uh, Victoria is in the trinket room, which naturally is the only room she's allowed to be in because it's her color. Everyone stays on their side of the ship. But if you rescue her first, then you can actually get a hint as to where some trinkets are after you've collected a few. And the world map's pretty wide open right now, so why don't we start by taking a look just around the actual ship itself. So this outer space area is called Dimension 6Vs. Uh, this hashed-in area is the ship, and as you can see, it's broken into little pieces. And of course there's the ship's hashtag, so if you want to tweet out them to rescue them, that's an option. But yeah, that's pretty much it. The main thing you're looking for out here are some landmarks, because... Oh, here's a good idea. Um, if you encounter spikes, one thing to do is they give you a little bit of practice, so that you can keep your skills sharp for when you actually get into a level. And they're generally indicators that you're onto something good. Uh, in this case, it's a trinket. In other cases, it's the actual level. Those are the two main things that you're looking for, but sometimes you'll run across some other things. Uh, this was kind of a dead end, though, so let's see if we can find some other areas out there. But yes, there are a couple of different ways to find your way around. You can just wander around like I'm doing here, looking for spikes. You have the option of bringing up your map and looking for the question marks that are teleporters. And usually near the teleporters, there's at least something good. And if you rescue Vermilion first, he will help you in the sense that he'll find areas that might be of interest. Usually that means that there's a crew member nearby or that there's a path to a crew member that you can still explore. But if you find him, odds are you're on top of it anyway and you were close to finding it anyway, but it's useful in uh, some specific cases. And this is your last way, so there are some monitors around that expand on some information you need. Inversion plane. We'll find out what that means in a bit. And there you go. Depending on which monitors you find, you're just going to get a clue as to where the first room in the level is. It doesn't exactly tell you how you're going to get there, but it does give you a clue once you've filled in the map a little bit about what direction you might need to go. And right now we're not close at all, so we should probably just take the teleport back. And see if we can get to Victoria. Of course, that was color-coded as well. And as it turns out, it's that little path down there that'll get us toward her area. Again, some spikes. Pretty much, you know, when you see some spikes that you're onto something. 
And what's this? So that's an area that doesn't look like anything we've seen just yet, and that's a really good indicator that we're right on top of the level. And there's a teleporter right outside, so if we needed to come back later, we can definitely do that. And this is it! Welcome to the laboratory! Get a little music change, and let's find out what that monitor meant by... There it is, the inversion plane. So, so far in the game, you've been able to control all of your movement. Now it's taking away a little bit of that control. And you've got to do a little bit more prediction of when you're going to land. So you can flip your gravity. But then, it, this is about as close to a jumping mechanic as you're going to get in the game. I should also mention, the level titles give you a hint sometimes as to how you're going to be able to beat the level. Or the room within the level. Not so much there, but here, don't flip out. If you were to flip on the ceiling and walk through those two things, you're landing on spikes. Stabilizing this dimension. So, all I really know is everybody left this area a while ago. And it looks like their dimension was unstable. Alright, so now we're back onto some of the harder rooms in the game, which contain the trinkets. That's another important thing about the game, is to just keep an eye out for what the challenge is. So, I find this is easier to get this way, now we've got four, than it is to get out. Because if you look at these two pillars in the middle, well, they don't time out exactly the same. They're not exactly symmetrical. So some of the puzzles you just have to do on reaction, some of them you can eyeball and then do a little bit of a better job. This is probably a good time to call attention to Captain Viridian's momentum, so he doesn't exactly stop on a dime, and the reason this is a challenge is, is just that. So here, for example, you really have to know exactly how quickly you're going to be able to turn, and it's part of the gradual mechanic introduction that the game does. So there, for example, you know, you can overshoot it or undershoot it, and you just have to learn about how quickly you're going to be able to move. I think that's a little bit of unintentional difficulty, but it is something that you can get used to. Whee! Ah. Oh. Now that, again, deaths aren't terribly punishing, but you do have to play it cautious a little bit. This is actually a, a neat use of the room mechanics, so each room is independent, and you can't necessarily see where you're supposed to go, and you have to maneuver correctly across multiple rooms, which engages your memory, and it's more like a timing issue than it is a platforming issue. So it takes the challenge in a different direction. Let's see, atmospheric filter. Oh, okay, so now we're also on to where the yellow area is, which we were connected to a bit before, and actually there was an exhaust chute there, so probably that will link up. Areas like this, with no real difficulty to them, are actually not exactly a waste of time, because they do get you used to the momentum and the movement speed, and they get you used to being able to go through little tiny gaps and understanding your precision movement is going to become pretty important right away. I really like the level design here because you have to expand on skills that you've already built on. So just to get to this point, you had to handle one area where you had to bounce and then turn, and now you have to do it a couple of times rapidly, and now that you're used to that timing, this isn't a trinket that isn't all that hard to collect. And now this section expands on a little bit further. Now you're totally unable to stop. And so now it's a little bit less lining up your shot, kind of getting it just right, and more timing. So you have the challenge of having to do it on reflex. I tend to be a little bit better with lined up shots. But here, once you learn the timing, it doesn't tend to be a challenge. Although, you do have the disadvantage of coming in from a brand new room, so you, again, can't quite line things up because you don't have the benefit of seeing it ahead of time. In this area, usually if you were learning it for the first time, you do that a little bit more slowly because you, 
you at least have the, the level designed in such a way that you can spy it. And, it. and that's true here, too. So you can picture a little bit of, if you were moving in a sine wave, where it would be safe. And there we go, here's Victoria. <laughs> That's probably more the result of Viridian being more of the adventurer type than the technology type. Let's see what's left to the level. Oh, that was brief. Yep, everybody's close to a teleporter, but doesn't know exactly where they're going to teleport to, so now we've got that taken care of. Alright, we're getting there. And, you know, that's all there is to it. You know, if we want to just save real quickly, we can do that. And let's see what Victoria's up to. Of course, everybody's given their own color-coded rooms. How did you get up there? I thought only I could flip. Yes, dark and scary. Unlike this room, with all the weird, creepy, eyeball-looking trinkets. As I mentioned, trinkets are very hard to collect. Uh, but there we are. We're about a third of the way there. It shines! This is not rocket science! Well, they're important because they're shiny. If you remember, the, the one that we found information on in the lab was Vitillary, so we will probably get a chance to rescue him the next time. And okay, we've seen that already. Let's do a quick check over here of what Violet has to say, and then we'll be all done for today. like walking around in familiar areas. It's more of a Viridian thing. She's suggesting that we rescue Vertigree, but I think next time we'll go ahead and go on the information we got, take a look in this new area, and get a hold of Vitillary. So we'll see you then.